Good afternoon. This is Dr. Indu Vishankar. Welcome you all on behalf of our esteemed DCA President, Dr. Dibendu Majumdar, Secretary Dr. Sabya Sachi Saha, and the team DCI to this eighth webinar today. That is medical history influencing implant outcomes and digital technology in implantology. It has been a commendable effort on the part of the Dental Council of India to organize these learning and knowledge sharing platforms, the success of which is evident from the steady rise in the number of participants from the country and abroad. Thanks to the effort of our esteemed president, secretary, and the whole team of the Dental Council of India for organizing these flawless events. Now, welcome to you all. And this has been a customary to give some instruction to the attendees. Now, while registering for the webinar, please furnish your correct email IDs for e-dispatch of your attendance certificates as many often problems are being faced for wrong email IDs. In case you don't get your certificates in your regular inboxes, please do not forget to check your junk mail boxes because sometimes the mail may get lost into your junk email. Please note that to get the attendance certificate, the entire session has to be attended uninterruptedly. Now, though we have a huge number of participants from many colleges, the highest attendance from colleges are listed. The highest attendance in order was first with the Sardar Patra Postgraduate Institute of Dental and Medical Sciences, Lucknow. In sequence, they are Siddhapur Dental College and Hospital, Gujarat, Neems Dental College and Hospital, Jaipur, Indoprastha Dental College and Hospital, Gaziabad, Vishnu Dental College, Bhimavaram, and Andhra Pradesh. Now, today's webinar is on dental implantology, which is the current demand in dentistry and the choice of most postgraduates, practitioners, researchers, and academicians. The discussion have two parts. The first part is in the medical history, which many a times has been overlooked or very lightly taken. The second part is the digital imaging, which have taken a very important share in the today's treatment planning. This is a very hot topic and soon will be covered by our speaker of today, Dr. Gunashilan Rajan. He is a well-known oral maxillofacial surgeon and implantologist in the country based at Chennai. He has both medical and dental qualification and is a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons in England. Besides being a oral maxillofacial surgeon of par excellence, he is a researcher, academician, and scientist as well. He has been awarded with Scientist Award by the Tamil Nadu government in 2002. His journey on the field of oral facial surgery is long and his success story is difficult to be enumerated within this short time in this webinar. He has a high legacy with him as well. He is the worthy son of the late Dr. B.P. Rajan, our past DCI president and the second vice chancellor of Tamil Nadu MGR Medical University. He is the first vice chancellor in the country from the dental fraternity to hold this post. Presently, he is the director of Rajan Dental Institute. Now, welcome Dr. Gunasharan. The screen is now yours. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Indipushankar, for those kind words of introduction. And also, thank you very much for remembering uh, my illustrious father. It's nice to see people remembered for their contribution to our profession. 
and uh, also as a vice chancellor of the medical university. Thank you very much for remembering him. I'd like to start my topic today, medical history influencing implant outcomes and digital technology in implantology. I'm going to break it up into two parts, but I'd certainly like to start with the physician's prayer because we should not look at the patient as a whole and not just as an oral cavity and teeth. Remember this prayer from Sir Robert Hutchison, from inability to let well alone, too much zeal for the new and contempt for what is old, from putting knowledge before wisdom, science before art and cleverness before common sense, from treating patients as cases. This is something I really don't like, you know, refer to the patient with his name or her name rather than as cases. And certainly finally, making the cure of the disease more grievous than the endurance, good Lord, deliver us. I think please keep this in mind at every time when you are going to treat a patient. I'm looking at two extremes. One is a medical history, which is where we all have to start. And then at the other end is a final prosthesis. So what is in between? is the evidence-based decisions. Because today we have science and technology with us. We need to look at the evidence-based decisions using high-end technology, which leads to precision, and certainly the safety of the patient. So the importance of using technology and to make it precise and safe is the whole goal of today's treatment. So let me start with the medical history, and then we'll go to the second part, which is the digital technology. We have gone past the era just to give a new tooth, or do you want to give a new smile, or do you want to give a patient a gift of a new life? Now, people may say, what is this? How is this possible using implants? We only think you can give a new tooth or a new smile. How can you give a new life? Look at this patient. You're not giving this patient just teeth. Okay. A young girl like this who's about 18, 19, you have completely restored her life and her confidence in life. So that's the importance of implantology today. We're not just restoring teeth. We're looking at the patient as a whole and giving them back I'm going to run through a small video so that you get a feel of what we mean by implantology. So here we are using a surgical stent, which is tooth based, and then using it to start the first part of the implant placement. So once you remove the stent, then you can see that we are placing the, the first implant and then using a direction indicator in place and then placing the next implant. So with the digital planning, which I will allude to later, you can see how this can become much more precise and much more predictable and much safer from the patient point of view. Let's go to the medical history now. I'm going to take it in terms of the common disorders that you see, the common medical issues. The commonest issue that you will see in your practice, I'm sure most of you see patients who are diabetic. The problem is we need to have a common sort of score 
to see what is the status of the diabetes and how can that be influencing your treatment for implantology. The HbA1c is a very common denominator because it gives you the three months average control. And when we say good control, it means the HbA1c is between 6.1 and 8. If it's moderate control, it is 8.1 to 10. And if it's poor control, the HbA1c is over 10. So we need to have some sort of a uniform guideline so that when we talk to one another, we understand what each one is saying. So some of you can make note of this uh, reference because this came out as a very important guideline as how would you treat these diabetic patients when they come for implantology. When the patient has good control of diabetes, implants are predictable. That's the important thing. When a patient has good control of diabetes, implants as predictable as a normal person. When they have poor control, you have all these problems of impaired osteointegration, higher risk of periimplantitis, and a higher failure rate. So when they are diabetic and they are poorly or moderately controlled, it's better to delay the loading of the implants usually after about one year of healing. You do not do what's called immediate loading. You give one year time for osseointegration and soft tissue integration and only then load these implants. This is a much safer way of handling patients who are diabetic, moderately poorly controlled. The whole issue is it means diabetic patient, diabetes is not, does not preclude you from treating those patients. However, we need to be very clear about the control and how well controlled it is and accordingly change your treatment plan. In such patients, especially diabetic patients, the use of antibiotics and a preoperative floor excedent is very helpful. Now look at this uh, study which showed the survival rate when floor excedent was used and when it was not used, a difference of almost 10%. Now, this is very important, a very simple thing like using a Clorex and mouth rinse. I'm sure most of you are using these mouth rinses today in these COVID days, you know, giving a preoperative rinse of Clorex and or uh, Povidon iodine. A simple thing like that has shown to make a 10% difference in survival rate. So please follow these. However, because you're looking at the patient as a whole, be careful about cofactors that are smoking, whether the patient is going to have simultaneous grafting whether you're using multiple implants, and if you're using only short implants, these are cofactors which can influence the success or failure in diabetic patients. Now look at this condition for a patient who had an implant earlier and landed up with an abscess on the skin. We did a IND and sent for culture sensitivity, came back for Klebsiella pneumoniae, and we drained the pus, and then when we checked the is glucose level, HbA1c was 9.4. So we don't have to panic when you have a situation like this, when the patient comes back to you, you know, he's probably developed diabetes recently. So we go on, treat that uh, diabetes and give them appropriate antibiotics and then they recover very well. I'm just gonna run through some of this infective endocardial prophylaxis. Some of the guidelines have changed it's used essentially for people who have prosthetic cardiac valves or prosthetic materials used in valve repair. Previous history of infective endocarditis and of course, unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease. Please remember now, unlike the days when we were in uh, uh, undergrad, rheumatic heart valve disease used to be an uh, uh, indication for prophylaxis. It is no more. A CABG or a pacemaker is not an indication for prophylaxis. Prophylaxis is also need, not needed for routine anesthetic injections, although you do come in touch with uh, blood, especially if you have a direct injection into a vessel, or taking radiographs or placing a removable prosthodontic or orthodontic appliances, shedding of deciduous teeth, and bleeding from trauma to the lips or mucosa. The antibiotic regime for this prophylaxis is amoxicillin, again, which was to be three grams, it's now become two grams, one hour before the procedure. 
clindamycin in case they're allergic to penicillin, 600 milligrams, one hour before the procedure. Then let's look at blood pressure. Look at stage one hypertension. If you have blood pressure, a systolic pressure of above 160 or a diastolic pressure of above 100, you need to be careful. You need to get it under control before you can do an implant. Anxiety, you know, affects blood pressure. So if you're going to do any patient who's a known hypertensive, please make sure that you use some stress reduction protocols. You could use some uh, oral sedatives one to two hours before the procedure, or you could use intravenous midazolam. Make sure that the patient empties the bladder before he sits in the chair, especially if it's a long procedure. A full bladder can actually increase anxiety. And especially if the patient is sedated, it can be even more difficult. So make sure that the patient has an empty bladder when he sits down for sedation. And then look at what medications can influence uh, hypertension control. Most of the patients are on medications for a very long time. So let's see how this can impact. Again, I'm not looking at any uh, particular order. I'm looking at what are the common medicines that are being used. Aspirin, a lot of antiplatelet drugs, patients who have had uh, a CABG, past uh, cardiovascular event or cerebrovascular events, they are all put on some form of antiplatelet drugs and commonly aspirin, ticlopidin or clopidogrel. Most of these medicines, uh, some of these are low dose medicines and we have to be careful about what you would do in such situations. If you have to do an implant or an extraction, the recommendation is that you wait for about six hours after the oral medication before you do the procedure. Important thing is you do not stop any medication. All the antiplatelet medications that the patient is on should be continued as it is. You do not stop it. There's a very common misconception among a lot of uh, practitioners. So you need to control the antiplatelet drugs only thing, as a precaution, you give at least six hours time after the oral medication uh, before you do the procedure. This was a very interesting uh, study that was published, uh, this timing part of six hours after oral medication by uh, Yoshikawa in 2019. People on warfarin, what do you do for such patients? The INR of two to three is recommended for arterial and venous thrombosis and 2.5 to four for mechanical heart valves. And this is the recommendation of the following societies. And this very important article, one of the uh, landmark articles, which shows the risk versus benefit of stopping warfarin what's called the Wall Systematic Review published in 2000. They reviewed 2014 surgical procedures, general surgical procedures, and showed that when warfarin was not stopped, there was no severe bleeding complications. Of course, there was some bleeding, but that could be managed by local hemostatic measures. When warfarin was stopped, however, four patients had fatal embolic complications. So this was a very important landmark article and then they came out with some recommendations. And they said, they classified what is a low risk treatment, moderate risk and high risk. A low risk was at one to five teeth, simple extraction. You see moderate risk, six to 10 teeth and high risk was more than 10 extractions. And they said in low risk, you can continue therapeutic warfarin. If it's a moderate or high risk, we do not have any significant data to give recommendations. So what you can do is convert those patients into low risk. Basically you do only one to six extractions, or one to six implants, and, and you can continue the therapeutic warfarin. And INR up to three is acceptable for such patients. When I, in our practice, when we see a lot of these patients who have put on warfarin, you look at the INR, even with medication, it doesn't go sometimes beyond one or 1.5 or two. 
So please check the INR levels for these patients and then do your measures. And of course, if you have any local bleeding, they can be easily controlled by these sort of measures. Alternatively, these patients can be put on subcutaneous heparin temporarily or as intramuscular heparin as outpatient procedure. The newer medications are these so-called direct oral anticoagulants as alternative to warfarin. Dabigatran is a thrombin inhibitor, which is given as a twice a day dosage. So it has a peak action of one to three hours. So when patients are on thrombin inhibitors, the recommendation is that you do the extraction 12 hours after medication. So basically you try to give up more time after medication before you do the procedure. Let's come to some very interesting data that's come out. This systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2018, for those of you who are a little academically oriented and want to take some, some uh, reference, please uh, note this. Because this is a very interesting article which showed uh, what are the medications that can have an Im impact on, especially with regard to failure of implants. And then you'll see that this actually includes quite a lot of uh, common medication that we use, NSAIDs, SSRIs, proton pump inhibitors, and bisphosphonates. The common NSAIDs which we use, aspirin, ibuprofen, diclofenac, silicoxib, naproxen. These are the common medications that we use, and all of them have an impact, and they are associated with increased implant failures. So alternatively, try to use parastamol or tremadol. The only problem with tremadol, sometimes you can have an opioid-like effect and could be addictive. For gastroesophageal reflex, common treatment is proton pump inhibitors like omeprazole, pantoprazole. I'm sure a lot of your patients are on those. So look at alternative medications such as prokinetics or antacids and try to maintain a low BM, BMI of less than 24. And I've seen some very interesting uh, uh, articles uh, coming from, uh, I think, Nagpur, one of the social medicine person, uh, Dr. Jagannath uh, uh, Dikshit. He's come out with some very interesting data about how you can reduce GRD, reduce obesity, reverse diabetes, just by controlling the diet and going to what's called a two times a day diet. Anybody interested in knowing more about these things, look, at, look up his uh, Jagannath uh, Dikshit uh, a website, a very interesting sort of uh, take on control of diabetes. A lot of patients today are on antidepressants, especially in COVID times, we've seen a phenomenal increase in this. These are these a class of antidepressants called SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, such as Prozac and Paxil. So these are also known to have been associated with the higher uh, implant failure rates. So when you have such patients, you can talk to the physician and see if they can be put on some alternatives, such as SNRI, such as serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, and monoamino oxidase inhibitors. Now, conversely, patients who are on highly hypertensive beta blockers and ACE inhibitors actually have shown better outcomes for implants. So that's an interesting data for us. You know, if you look at these classes of medicines that most of these patients are on, and if they're on antihypertensives, you're already on a slightly positive uh, wicket. So just be aware of these factors. What about steroids? A lot of patients are on long-term steroids for a lot of, med uh, uh, medic uh, for a lot of uh, medical problems. However, the Mayo Clinic has shown that there's no adverse effects of steroids but still you should exercise caution as far as the maxilla is concerned, simply because of the quality of the bone. Let's look at another interesting thing of osteoporosis. DEXA scan is considered to be a, a diagnostic to say what, which patients are osteoporotic or which patients are osteopenic. So, a uh, value of minus one to minus 2.5 standard deviation is considered osteopenia. 
and more than minus 2.5 standard deviation is considered osteoporosis. And of course, for these patients, you put them on uh, medications, and then you also ask them to avoid smoking, avoid excess alcohol, control the BMI. These patients are usually put on anti-resorptive medications, like such as bisphosphonates, and also in addition to that, vitamin D and calcium as supplementaries. So many of our patients who are older patients, especially women, are put on bisphosphonates, such as allantonic acid and these following. These uh, trade names may be familiar for some of you. However, the trend is changing. More than bisphosphonates, people are using monoclonal antibodies such as uh, denosumab and also uh, uh, other medications such as teriparatide. What's the problem with bisphosphonates? If, especially if you're on IV bisphosphonates, the chances of medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw is as high as 2%, which is a big risk with any sort of treatment, especially if you're doing an extraction or a surgical procedure or an implant. You need to be very careful about uh, if a patient is on IV bisphosphonates. With oral bisphosphonates, you're much safer. However, you still need to know that there are a slight or higher risk. Although today, you can speak to your physician or the orthopedic surgeon who's put them on medicines and see if they can be on some newer alternatives such as teriparatide, abloparatide. Teriparatide is given as a subcutaneous injection like uh, insulin, and it's got none of the side effects of bisphosphonates. So when you see such patients with bisphosphonates, please talk to the physician and see if they can go on to some alternatives which are also available today. CTX is considered a, a marker for osteoclastic activity. So if patients are on bisphosphonates, they look at the level of uh, uh, serum cross-linked C telopeptide, and then they say if the levels are less than 150 picograms, there's more indication that this patient may land up with osteonecrosis. So the patient of, who was taking uh, bisphosphonates one small test that you could do is using uh, CTX analysis. And if the patient is on any medication, ask them to give a drug holiday. Ask them to stop the medication until the CTX level becomes more than 150 picograms per ml. However, you must be aware that there is a small additional risk of developing fractures. The patient has to be extremely careful. What about thyroid disorders? Patients who are hyperthyroid are sensitive to adrenaline that we use in our uh, infiltrations and blocks. If they're hypothyroid, they can, you have to be very cautious with sedatives. Immunosuppressants such as methotrexate, cyclosporin, again, which is used for a lot of medical conditions. The evidence for implant-related uh, outcomes are conflicting. We don't have clear guidelines on that. What about hyposalivations, Sjogren's syndrome, etc. It's not a contraindication. So implants do very well. In fact, we have a couple of patients in follow up for more than 10 years, and we have got very good results for those patients. So uh, survival rate is almost a 100%. Parkinson's disease, there's a slightly slower, lower survival rate. For these conditions, there are really no uh, not enough articles that we can rely on to give us some guidance. And then, last but not least, a true titanium allergy. Of course, this happens. Uh, we have to be wary of patients who have any other type of metal allergy, especially in our country where people wear jewelry. Uh, <clears throat> so, if they have any evidence of, or if they have a history of any metal allergy, be a little more watchful there's a high likelihood that they may also have titanium allergy and reject your implant. <clears throat> of course, there are tests such as skin patch test and a memory lymphocyte MELISA test, which can be done to assess this. So we come to the first end of the first part, which is a medical history, which I think is very important for you to keep in mind when treating such patients. It also put you on a, a, a different level of 
understanding and comfort zone for the patient because you're looking at the patient as a whole. You're looking at the patient as an entire entity rather than just looking at teeth. And if you ask them to do some tests like uh, glycosylated hemoglobin, or for example, even if you want to be even more uh, uh, careful, you can do a free insulin level. You know, a level of free insulin or fasting insulin level. A fasting insulin level is a much better, a fasting insulin level is a, a much better way to analyze or look at the diabetic control. You can ask for a DEXA scan and look at their osteoporosis or osteopenic individuals. So these are very important to analyze and then look at the medication history because that is also very significant. You've seen that so, so many of these medications can influence the outcome of an implant. So be very careful when analyzing and go through it in great detail. And then of course you go through the surgery of the implant and then go on to the final processes. So I'm going to take you right to the next uh, uh, end of the spectrum, which is where you can use technology to help patients. Quickly, I'm going to run through the fundamentals implant fixture is a titanium part that goes into bone, which also integrates. And then it has a, a smooth surface, which is for mucosal integration. And on top of that goes an abutment, which can either be straight or it can be angled, depending on how your implant emerges and what type of processes you're planning. And then you have the crown that comes on top of the abutment, which can either be a cemented crown or a screw retained crown. The implant osseointegration integration period is usually three months for the mandible and six months for the maxilla. These are all, you know, standard uh, conventional healing periods. But today we have got much better designs. We have got titanium zirconia coatings. We have got surface modifications, which allows you immediate loading or early loading within six weeks. There are newer techniques such as the all-on-4 and zygoma implants, which allow you to splint these implants and load immediately. So although conventionally we wait six months for the maxillary implants to integrate and three months for the mandibular implants to integrate, with newer designs and newer techniques, all these things are changing rapidly. What about the age or timing of the implant treatment? You normally do an implant only after growth completion and maturity of the skeleton. So you wait for growth completion before you can place an implant. Again, this is conventional, but there can always be an exception to these. And one such exception is ectodermal dysplasia. Especially if the patient has needs a restoration in the mandible, there is literature to show that they are shown as young as three years of age. So we had a patient of ectodermal dysplasia with five year, who was five years old. So we knew we, we could do that because most of the mandibular growth is complete by that age for in a patient with ectodermal dysplasia. So he was uh, wearing dentures and of course his lower denture was had very little stability and retention. So we could do two implants for him in the mandible and have an overdenture. So which led to much better retention and a much better quality of life. So this is what is possible today with newer technology and what we learned from the newer articles. Implant today is moved away from a completely surgical uh, driven subspecialty to a prosthetically and aesthetically driven stealth surgery. And people are already predicting that this will be the future of implant industry. 
what's called stealth surgery or digital surgery. People certainly don't want implants, they want teeth. And you have to place the implant exactly in the desired position, which supports a better implant and gives better processes mechanics. Why do you need to look at all this? So that you can have a long-term functional and a long-term aesthetic results. Well, this is for this reason only you need to do proper planning and use all the technology that is available. This essentially is reverse engineering. So when we start off the standard of care for most implant placements is today taking a cone beam CT. And then you virtually plan the processes and then back work towards planning the implant. And then you decide whether there's sufficient bone or insufficient bone. And if you have sufficient bone, well, sorry. So if you have sufficient bone, you would go ahead with implant placement. You can do either open surgery or a guided surgery. If you have insufficient bone, and then you would do open surgery and also do some grafting. So let's start with the cone beam CT. Although a lot of planning can be done with intraoral X-rays and the panoramic X-ray, the standard of care today is a cone beam CT. And what is the advantage of this cone beam CT compared to a conventional medical CT? One important thing is a much lesser exposure time, which means much less, much, much lesser radiation. You can see that the radiation is 128 microsieverts average compared to almost four times in the CT scan. And the other huge advantage in cone beam CT is there is very little scatter when you have metal restorations compared to a CT scan where there is much more scatter. Now, you know that most of the patients who come will already have a pre-existing a restoration or a metallic crowns or bridges. So if you have lesser scatter, it's obviously going to give you much more accurate measurements and your planning can be much more accurate. So a cone beam CT today is the standard of care, a gold standard compared and not a CT scan. And the slices are also much thinner. You can go to as less as 0.1 millimeter slice in a cone beam CT. So to recapture, we have designed the processes, determine implant size and position, and determine the implant angulation. And if you have sufficient bone, you can do fully guided surgery or an open flap surgery. So this choice, whether you want to do fully guided surgery or an open surgery is a really clinician centric. You know, there are certain situations where you can completely reliably do fully guided surgery, especially if you have enough uh, keratinized tissue. If not, it's better to do an open flap surgery. If you have insufficient bone, you have the option of doing what's called a, a semi-guided surgery, which means you do the pilot drill with a surgical guide, and then you open the flap as an open procedure and do add regenerative procedures because you do not have sufficient bone. You can already open the flap straight away as a full open flap surgery and add regenerative procedures such as a bone graft or a membrane and create more bone. Or you can use alternative techniques where you do not, you can use what's called remote anchorage like the pterygoids or the zygoma, a bone and take support. So this is a situation where a patient is missing uh, a central incisor. So you've, you've got a scan, you've overlaid a processes on top of it. So you know you match the processes, the missing tooth in relation to the adjacent tooth for the contour, position, etc. And then you back work from here and see how much bone is there and what is the position of the implant. So you can see here that there is sufficient bone, there's a good volume of bone. You can see that 
the thickness of the alveolar crest is quite good to take in a fairly wide type of implant. The height of the bone is also adequate. So once you determine that you've got enough position, enough bone for an implant, then you plan the implant and then you also place a virtual abutment in its place. So implant and the abutment planned. And then you can see a straight abutment would emerge to the labial surface of the tooth. A straight abutment will come like this. Whereas if you put an angled abutment, you can take it down towards a single on side. So all this can be planned well ahead of time. So you can see that your decision of the implant placement, the decision of the abutment, whether it's straight or angled, can all be made in this planning stage. Can we do this even for a full arch? Certainly we can do that. So you have an articulated model and then you have what's called a duplicated denture, which is then to which you can incorporate some radio opaque markers. You can use gutta percha, zinc phosphate, make punch some holes and then fill it up with radiographic markers in, in multiple locations. And once you do that, you can see that it's done not only on the occlusal surface, but also on the palatal and the labial surfaces. And this is called the radiographic guide. Now using this guide, the patient keeps it in the mouth in occlusion, and then a CBCT is done. So now you've got a good idea of the soft tissue interface with the denture and the underlying bone. You can see that these radiographic markers show up very clearly on the scan. And once you have these sort of uh, uh, markers showing up on the scan, you can, with the dual scan, you can now impose a denture. You can superimpose the processes on top of the underlying bone, which can then let you evaluate the position of the bone in relation to particular teeth. For example, what's the bone present under the incisor or the canine region or the molar, the, the, uh, the relationship to the sinus, etc. And then you could select the implants and then you can select the abutment almost like the same way that we chose the abutment for the individual teeth. And then you go on to planning it. The file format for these are the STL files, what we call as a surface tessellated language or STL file. Of course, there are other file systems, but the most common ones is the STL file. And then once you've got the superimposition, you start the planning. And you can see clearly how the implant position in relation to the buccal and lingual cortices in relation to important structures such as the infra inferior alveolar nerve. And there also you look at the position of the implant and the abutment and the crown. You also look at the space that is available for your processes. Many a time people make a mistake of placing these implants very shallow at this point and then do not have enough space for the uh, processes. So it's very important to plan the position of the implant three-dimensionally. And then you superimpose a crown on top of it and see how it occludes with the opposing dentition. And here you can play around with this planning and see for the emergence of the prosthetic screw. So you look at the labial side, you look at the occlusal aspect, and you can see how the emergence of the prosthetic screw, you can of course move it a little more lingual if you want, or a little more distal, depending on how much of material you want in the other parts of the tooth. And then using this data, we fabricate what's called a surgical guide. So this is to aid in placing the implant in a very, very precise manner. So, the fabrication of the surgical guide is then done using all this data. The surgical 
guides can be categorized as follows. They can either be completely bone supported surgical guides, or they could be tooth supported guides or mucosa supported surgical guides. So each has a role and each is used in different situations, which uh, 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 I can't go into now, but just be aware that these have bone supported, tooth supported and mucosa supported guides. And there are some parameters. For example, what should be the minimum height of the sleeve? Because you do not want your, your drills to go wobbling. When you have planned it very precisely, you need the sleeve height of certain height, minimum dimension. For example, you need at least a five millimeter sleeve height. Anything lesser than that can introduce some inaccuracies. The materials make a difference. The sleeve offset is a different. So you can see that a lot of planning goes into making a surgical guide. And once you have a guide like this, you can be sure that the positioning of an implant is going to be exactly as you planned using all the data that from the CT scan and the intraoral scanner. So you merge the data from your CBCT and the intraoral scan, and then you come to a, a situation like this where you have the very nice surgical guide. And this guide is now placed and used for implant fixture surgery. So you can see that this is fitted on the teeth and it is completely seated. You have a viewing window to just to make sure that the guide is fully seated because if this is not fully seated, then you will introduce inaccuracies. So it's a fully seated guide. And then you can see the position of the, uh, where you've got to drill. And once you uh, do the implant site preparation, this is what's called a fully guided uh, surgery. We have not even opened the flap. We have just made a keyhole punch. And this is simply because the patient had enough volume of bone and had enough keratinized tissue. If you do not have enough volume of bone or enough keratinized tissue, you cannot do this punch technique. So this is a fully guided surgery where you just punch and then you can place the implant and you can see that the position of the uh, implant is appropriate, is far away from the nerve and is placed deep enough so that you have enough space for, you have enough space for the processes. So that's very important. So I'm going to take you through maybe one more short video. Just give me a second. So we have the a video which shows the okay we have taken out this patient had some uh, deficient bones so we had grafted earlier and what we took out now was the membrane a titanium reinforced membrane and then we are using the stent so the stent is now used So just check the position of the pilot drill. I'm using this as a, just for the pilot drill. And then we have opened the flap. And once I open the flap, we drill the position. And you can see again, the, we use a direction indicator. So when you have a very restricted space like this for central and lateral, it's important that you have very accurate planning, otherwise you will not have an ideal processes. And this is even more important for a patient with a high smile line. You need to be very, very uh, careful with the positioning. You need to be parallel. You need to plan your processes. And based on that, you reverse work and place the implants. Now look at this situation where we have, the patient has missing molars and the sinus has dipped in quite a bit. So this panoramic 
version of the CBCT shows that the molars are missing, the sinuses are expanded. So this goes through the same process. We use a, a digital intraoral scanner to scan for the data. You have a CBCT and you merge both the data, the CBCT data and the intraoral scanner and then plan the implants. And then you can see that some of the implants, the bone height is not enough. So we need to plan maybe a couple of millimeters, two to three millimeters of implant is going into the sinus. So that has to be planned as an, what we call as an indirect sinus lift. So once you've done this planning, then you look at it more carefully and closely and see whether we, we need, you can see that this implant is almost about two to three millimeters within the sinus. And this can be done as a closed technique. And once the sleeve is placed and the, the process is also planned, you got the whole range of instruments that you need to do the guided surgery. So for me, this is also a very interesting thing to show a patient about the planning, the meticulous planning that goes into the treatment plan and the number of drills that we use. It can be a very good patient education tool. So once we have the emergence of the prosthetic screw, you've determined where you want to place it. You can then fabricate the surgical stent based on this prosthetic position. So we already planned the processes. And for instance, if I want this site to be changed to a three unit bridge, instead of two molars, if I want to make it as three premolars, I can do this. I can move this position a little away and then plan for two implants, but a three unit bridge. And then the surgical stent is fabricated like this. And then the procedure is finished. What it does is, a surgeon with maybe 20 or 30 years experience and an implantologist with even a two or three years experience can get identical results using this technology. So that's a very interesting aspect of this technology, making it so much user friendly and making it almost uh, idiot proof as a technique. It improves the standard of care. And very important is there is more litigation protection. Today is a litigious society. Almost 50% of litigations are surgical and implant related. So you need to be very careful about this. Look at this situation in a partial edentulous situation. Patient has just two teeth left. <clears throat> With a nice stent like that, you can make very accurate implant placement and prosthetic position. And this is the important thing the prosthetic position of your screws, the prosthetic screws are in such a nice arch form. You do not have any problems of uh, oral hygiene issues or overhanging margins, etc. And then the same thing can be also used for pretty extensive implants, of, such as zygoma implants. So when you do single zygoma implants, when there is very little maxillary bone and you want to restore the processes, a full arch process in the maxilla, you can use what's called zygoma implants. You can also use what's called a quad zygoma implants. So when you, uh, you have almost zero bone in the anterior maxilla, you can use two, two zygoma implants on either side. Of course, these are little more uh, extensive surgeries which has to be done under a general anesthesia. But what you can see is when you use a guided surgery, the positioning of these even so-called difficult implants becomes so much more accurate. And you have enough distance between the apices of these implants, which is very difficult with free hand surgery. So guided surgery can be a real boom in these sort of situations. And again, see how those four implants are in an ideal prosthetic position. There's no point putting in implants where you find bone and then having uh, overlapping processes or a, a process with a large buccal cantilever. So it's, these are the advantages of using a guided surgery. From patient's point of view, safety is a very important aspect. Poor visibility in places such as the pterygoid or zygoma, including the anterior mandible. People may say, what's the difficulty in anterior mandible? Anterior mandible can be one of the very difficult areas to treat. In fact, 
whatever mortality has been reported in implants is all related to anterior mandible. So you need to be extremely careful of the anterior mandible when you treat. It's simply because of the resorption pattern of the mandible. You can see how the mandible is completely resorbed in a, in a fashion. That if you come with an implant and go straight down, you'll go into the uh, sublingual and submandibular spaces. And these sort of complications have been reported, which are fatal or at the best life-threatening. So these sort of patients require Im emergency intubations. So you can see again where guided surgery can be very useful in such situations when you're planning. This looks as if these implants have gone through the nerve, but actually they have bypassed the nerve on the lingual side. So a guided surgery can be really useful in full arch situations. And it can also lead to a very nice anterior posterior spread, which gives you very less cantilever. Certainly it leads to much more precision. You can see that these two implants these X-rays are taken almost 15 years apart. And you can see that the bone levels have maintained very well. So this was among one of our first uh, uh, few guided surgeries. You can see how they really help in maintaining the uh, bone levels also. Certainly predictability, when you have an overdenture that's needed for a little older patient. So you have, if you look at this picture, you may say, that these implants are too lingually placed in relation to the ridge, but this is precise positioning as far as the process is concerned. So you'll see that with this, we make an overdenture, and this can lead to uh, such a boom for a patient who has very poor attention in the lower arch and very resolved mandibles with the, with the mental foramen is almost at the ridge level. So this is a very useful uh, procedure the time to teeth, that is from the implant placement up to finalizing the process can be reduced tremendously because of this. I alluded to this earlier that this will also lead to a de-skilling of the surgeon and the surgery, but that's not going to happen with all technology. You see artificial intelligence, machine learning, all this is certainly going to lead to a de-skilling of the surgeon, but makes it safer for the patient. However, like I said, implantology from single tooth to multiple teeth can be a great thing to give a new smile, a new tooth, but it can also change lives. How can we influence changing lives like this? Syndromic patients like this young girl in the mid twenties, and look at us panoramic, CVCT has very little bone, very large sinuses. You have no choice but to do implants and that to some advanced level of implantology. So when you change a patient like this, you're changing their lives. Syndromic patients with two teeth hanging in, again, a young girl. So most of, you'll see more and more patients who are younger who benefit with this treatment. Again, a rare condition such as primary failure of eruption. So this patient came with a situation like multiple impacted teeth. We investigated her and then the final diagnosis was a primary failure of eruption. Again, a younger patient. So our thing of implant patients being older patients is not there anymore. We feel a lot of patients who are younger who need this sort of treatment. We do multiple implants, all in all technique or zygoma, and then restore them. So in these ways, we can really change a patient's life. So you as a doctor, I think can make a huge impact on patients by doing implant treatment. I'll end with this quote from Aristotle who said, life is a gift of nature, but the quality of life that you give to a patient is a gift of your wisdom. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Gunashilan, for an excellent presentation. You made such a complicated process so simple it was so inspiring for the youngsters. In fact, a lot of questions have been looking into and they'll be definitely inspired by your presentation. And it was both covering the surgeon's perspective as well as a prosthodontist's perspective on implants. 
and as you know it is very customary and you will be happy also to answer some of the questions from the participants now for the participant i beg your excuse it is very difficult to cover all your queries and some of them also are too personal but however we have picked up some questions that will be helpful for participants as a whole so guna uh people have asked how do you learn to for proper implant placement how do you learn how do you learn they have asked how do you learn doing proper implant placement i think uh, today uh, implants have been practiced extensively all over the country i think they need to find a good teacher and you find good teachers in every part of the country every city has uh, good teachers good uh, long term see there are lot the teaching uh, is also undertaken in a lot of colleges today implant training as part of the curriculum uh, but those who have missed it can always go to some well run uh, implant programs and maybe you know over a six months or a one year period or two year period programs uh, of course lot of commercial programs are run by uh, implant companies but those will be very focused on uh, techniques or their own system you need to learn, learn the science of implantology and i think that is very important and that should come from uh, some courses run by big academies or by universities and uh, uh, international bodies like the icoi and uh, iti a lot of them run some very very good academic programs and then combine it with some uh, practical uh, classes because you need to you know get hands on experience and that's why i think you should uh, look at some good mentors and uh, every region of the country has good mentors very good uh, clinicians i think you should find the right person and get mentored by them uh, thank you guna but uh, a linked questions though it has come a little late and on but many of them are asked about the future of doing implantology and very simply they have asked whether a diploma in implantology or mds uh, well i i have been a dental council member before and we have discussed this in the council i think it's a very appropriate body to ask but not the appropriate person i am not the right person as of now but uh, uh, rakar you are there and a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, members who are very up to date are here i think that's the need of the hour no doubt about it to introduce a program that will be recognized by the council uh, you know a one year program or a two year program or even a three year program maybe uh, 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 i think it's certainly the the need of the because implantology is one of the fastest growing uh, sub specialties of dentistry all over the world not just here so there's almost a 20% you know a uh, jump in implant the usage and uh, Uh, practice year on year so this is one of the most rapidly growing and uh, rapidly changing uh, sub specialty of dentistry and uh, and it, you saw that it goes through so many uh, you know aspects of dentistry right from your medical history to the oral surgical part the diagnostic part imaging part and then the planning part and then your prosthetic part and long term maintenance part and then the soft tissue perio issues aesthetic issues grafting every aspect of dentistry is covered so i think it is uh, 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 the future is really bright for implantology but uh, the future lies in the person who takes up the job you know there's a, a quite a famous quote there's no future in any profession <laughs> you know the future lies in the person who does the profession so i think uh, they must take a clue train themselves well arm themselves with an extra a diploma or a degree or at least a long certificate from a good university before they start practice thanks guna and uh, many questions are on basic pharma pharmacological lessons action of many medicines on the health and all which is very difficult to cover but many people just wanted to know about the controversy of the i mean putting implants in patients with aspirin in particular could you please throw some light on it see uh, today uh, there's no controversy 
if a patient is on low dose aspirin 75 milligrams or 81 milligrams you continue the aspirin as it is and then do your treatment whether it's implant or extraction only okay. thing is you make sure that you have give sufficient time you get at least a 6 hour gap after the medication before you do the procedure that adds to the safety and then once you finish the procedure you make sure you have good hemostatic control so what are the local measures you know you would use some uh, absorb gel you would do some oxidized cellulose you would do suturing you would do some uh, uh, thermocautery so the important thing is not to stop the aspirin and i know even till today i have cardiologists and physicians telling patients stop it for 3 days 5 days prior to the procedure i write back to them i put it in writing that i do not need the patient to be reducing or stopping aspirin if you insist i will stop otherwise today my our literature and i actually sometimes give them a small reference you know like this uh, a walls article or some new systematic reviews and then a lot of them actually accepted and then then they let the patient continue the aspirin but having said that i know there are a few uh, physicians and cardiologists who still insist on stopping it but then i have a written documentation in my hand saying that they have asked them to stop i have not asked them to stop so this is what is very important in today's day because of litigation protection you need to document things and i can assure you we have done enough implants enough full arch implants without stopping or reducing aspirin and the literature yeah. support is there for you so please yeah. be aware of this thank yeah, you i agree to your yeah. answer sonju and uh, you talked uh, in between about this allergy so is there any option for this any other option to avoid allergy to these metals a uh, good question today we have an option of a uh, a non metallic implant which is a zirconia implant so zirconia is uh, now a, a great option we were not using it much earlier because it came as one part implant that is the the implant fixture going into the bone and the abutment part was one piece which made it very difficult to control the angulation of the prosthetic screw etc but today we have what's called a two part zirconia implant and that is a huge boom for people who are allergic or very suspect an allergy it's also very useful in a aesthetic area you know you know high smile line maxilla when you think or you know a, the aesthetic score you look at the aesthetic score and then decide on that so zirconia implants have a great future and they are already available today the only negative thing about them is the cost factor as of today thank you guna our uh, people talk about nowadays about pterygoid implants can you throw some light uh it is definitely not for the beginner if you have done you know enough implants and if you are probably a maxillofacial surgeon then you can venture into it however i didn't mention briefly that it's a blind spot so with technology with using guided surgery it may be a good option today because it's a good support support of bone it can be used with guided surgery but without guided surgery i'll be very very uh, wary of using a pterygoid implant and even from the prosthetic point of view the pterygoid implants usually emerge so far posterior in the maxilla that they can be a big challenge from the prosthetic part of it and hygiene maintenance etc so pterygoid implants is definitely at a later stage of later stage of your growth in the field of implantology and certainly preferably with the help of a guided surgery thank you guna again the very long list of questions but again with some selective questions yes yeah, somebody is asked whether you have any security program going through the security checkups in the airport with these dental implants uh not at all not not at all it's nothing more than the titanium plates that are used for fracture fixation and all that it doesn't beep it doesn't have any no issues at all thank you again there was a question is there any difficulty in the future taking mri if you have dental implants with you not not at all actually no issues at all with mri taking mri later on oh, that's great and some people have asked yes there was question 
but uh, he didn't understood what is the meaning of implants are predictable. Can you explain for him? Uh, implants are predictable. Yeah. Can we explain? I mean, probably he has missed some part. He has repeated implants are predictable. So, and he says again, which is the best implant material in the current clinical practice? Okay, I'll answer the second question. The, the implant material is, as of date, the standard material is uh, titanium, commercially pure titanium, CP titanium, grade four, grade five what is called uh, titanium 6-AL4V, six parts of uh, uh, aluminum and four parts of vanadium. So that's a commercially pure titanium is the material of choice. Now with uh, zirconia coming in as an option. So zirconia as a implant material is also a great option today. So these are the, 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 the today the materials that are used for implants. When I say predictable, the long-term predictability of an implant or survival of the implant will depend not just on anatomical factors. It will also depend a lot on biomechanical factors, oral hygiene maintenance, these sort of issues. So when you plan properly, you look at the quality of the bone, the quantity of the bone, the location of your implant collar, the amount of bone that's available at the level of the crest of the implant, you need at least about one to 1.5 millimeter bone there. You need to have keratinized mucosa at the emergence of the implant. So these are the things, the planning part, if you do it adequately, and how do you plan adequately? Using CT scans and using intraoral scanners or CT scans, and you take good models and make uh, processes and then do a, a dual scanning technique. So when you do all these precautions and do an implant, you have a much better long-term success and predictability. That's what I mean by predictability of the implant. Thank you, Gaurav. A little away from this monotonous question, somebody was probably is very scared. He has asked, can sunlight kill coronavirus? He's very optimistic. What, say again? Can sunlight kill coronavirus? A little away from this regular topics. Can sunlight kill sunlight coronavirus? Kill a coronavirus? Yeah. He if wants that, that wants to know if, if, if that was the case, we won't have coronavirus in India. We have not sunlight. <laughs> no, certainly not. Yeah. Thank you, Guna. You have covered these topics excellently. And one very personal question to you by many. And I also was in doubt whether I should ask it or not. But since there was lot many why did you pursue BDS after MDBS? It's very personal. You can ask, you can answer them personally if they write to you. Yes, I'll probably answer that personally. Okay. Ah, thank you, Gunal. It was a really excellent coverage of the topic and thank all. You. And now... Uh, Thank you again for your uh, kind attention and those uh, wonderful questions. I really appreciate the time that you spent uh, on, a, uh, on a Sunday evening and uh, uh, listening to my presentation. I look forward to seeing you, most of you, sometime or, or other. Thank you very much. Good evening. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we have a lot of participants attending this seminar this webinar and again I'm happy to say that the topmost college of participants on last webinar on 16th August I will be happy to read them again. Sadar Pati Postgraduate Institute of Dental and Medical Science Lucknow, Siddhapur Dental College Hospital Gujarat, Nims Dental College Hospital Jaipur, in the Prasthi Dental College Hospital, Gajiabad, Vishnu Dental College, Vimavaram, Andhra Pradesh. And next, we'll be happy to announce here that the next webinar will be on 30th August 2020 at 4 p.m. The topic will be on dental caries, the current concept of dental caries. 
It will be presented by Dr. Sinivas Vanaki, Principal and Professor, Coropathology, PM NM Dental College and Hospital, Bagalkot, Karnataka. And the session will be moderated by Dr. R. Radhakrishnan, Director, Department of Coropathology, Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Manipal. And would be very happy to get as many number of participants as we can get. Now, at the end of this webinar, I would like to thank our esteemed president, Dr. Dibindu Mazumdar, whose vision was to promote learning. And I'm happy, I'll be happy to thank Dr. Sabya Sachi Saha, who has already been in support for all these activities. And I'm extremely grateful to the DCI team and the technical support team by help of whom we have been able to conduct this webinar very successfully. And thank you very much. And looking forward to see you very soon. Namaskar. Thank you all. Jai Him. Thank you very much on my behalf also. Uh, I would like to record my special thanks to the Dental Council members, the EC, and in particular to the President, Dr. Majumda, for uh, reposing faith in my uh, uh, teaching uh, concern and interest and giving me this opportunity. I don't think I've ever spoken to an audience of more than uh, 10,000 people at one go. It, you know, it's a, it, it's a very humbling experience. So I'd like to thank the entire team uh, 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 on DCI, head, led by Dr. Majumda, the ECN, the members, and Dr. Saha, uh, who has also been uh, instrumental in, uh, you know, coordinating everything. And I think the more important, I'm very happy that uh, some of the participants brought up this question of, uh, uh, you know, implant education and, a, you know, a diploma or fellowship. So I think they're given a lot of homework for the entire dental council now to work on. I'm very happy about that. And I'd like to thank my coordinator, Dr. Indabhushan Kurt. We go back many, many years and uh, a lot of trust and respect, uh, mutual respect between us. Thank you, Indu, for taking me through this. And Dr. Virinda Goyal, thank you for your absolute professionalism uh, when we went through this uh, program, uh, day for yesterday, the, the rehearsal. Uh, I'm really impressed. And uh, I think the success of this program is largely due to your efforts. And certainly at the back, ground uh, Mukesh, the entire technical team. And uh, hats off to you for uh, taking this to a different level of education. And this is the future of education, I think. And I think uh, uh, the Ministry of Health and uh, Family Welfare Government of India has also taken a right step forward in this uh, aspect. So thank you very much again. It's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I just wish I could have seen each one of you on my screen, but I'm sure I'll meet one, all of you sometime or other. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Well, thank you all. Thank you all participants and the team again. I'm looking forward to see you soon. And with this, we declare close of this webinar. Thanks again.